So, here's Professor Rob Eilif from the University of Oxford, who's going to talk to us about Newtonianism. One paradigm shift for many. Uh, right, thanks very much um, for, it, for inviting me today, Joe. Um, I'm going to uh, pay some attention to what Kuhn said in uh, the structure. I'll try and reduce uh, the, the 22 definitions to something like two uh, workable approaches. Um, I'll talk about the, the notion of a paradigm. I don't, I don't think necessarily it's, uh, it, it's useful to distinguish it from a, a tradition, but we can talk about that. I'll talk about a variety of uh, 17th century philosophical or scientific paradigms. Then I'll talk about uh, Newton, and then I'll, I'll go back to what Kuhn says, uh, partly in the, in the postscript, the 1969 postscript published in the second 1970 edition of the structure of scientific revolutions, and, and talk about where, where Kuhn, I think, is really significant and uh, still underused, which is in terms of uh, schools, uh, because I think that's what he was really interested in. It's about training and how uh, ideas get uh, not just created, but consolidated and disseminated, spread, appropriated. Um, so, yeah, 1962, the uh, year before, uh, sexual intercourse, so it's a heady time for uh, major revolutions in cultural thinking. Uh, Kuhn's work um, came as a, as a bombshell. I think it was taken up extraordinarily quickly uh, by commentators, um, I think, uh, for, for reasons that are somewhat unclear, uh, but certainly social sciences uh, took up the notion of paradigm. They, they, they wanted, people in social sciences wanted to know whether their uh, disciplines and sub-disciplines were truly paradigmatic and therefore uh, scientific. Uh, and as many of you know, the Kuhn's emphasis on, on dogma was seen by people like Karl Popper as a, as a defence or a, an endorsement of a sort of totalitarian element within science. So, Kuhn's work was uh, discussed in a very lively way uh, throughout the 1960s and, and 1970s. And the structure of scientific revolutions is uh, par excellence with uh, no competitors, uh, the most influential text in the history of the history and philosophy of science. Uh, and it's something, it's an incredibly rich document of just over 100 pages. And I, I commend it to you. Um, nature of paradigm. Um, Kuhn was uh, criticised to some extent for the uh, nebulosity of his term. Uh, he uh, dealt with it to some extent in uh, writings after the structure. Um, so a, a large part of his career afterwards was uh, devoted to, I think, thinking through the fruitful implications of his own ideas. Um, a paradigm is constitutive of, of normal science. Normal science is uh, what takes place uh, routinely. It's constitutive of ordinary normal science. Uh, science uh, produces uh, anomalies, or if you want to psychologize it, a crisis. And uh, revolutionary science is, is what follows before it becomes normal. During normal science, uh, science progresses cumulatively. It consists in puzzle solving, uh, removing anomalies within the system, uh, producing new anomalies, uh, and uh, fundamentally involved in what we call uh, routine science. And Kuhn uh, wanted to show that that is what almost all science in the past has been, regardless of the fact that we concentrate on those moments, those great moments in history, uh, where there are revolutionary uh, transformations in science, which philosophers of science take to be constitutive of the scientific method, but in fact, as Kuhn said, they're not. Um, the core features of normal science are agreed upon by the community. Um, there is a scientific community. Uh, Kuhn uh, was favourable towards the term sociology, uh, and he appealed to sociologists uh, many times throughout the structure of scientific revolutions. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I want to divide the, the notion of paradigm into t two elements, really. One is uh, conceptual 
and one is practical. In the first sort of bundle of definitions or sub-definitions, uh, according to Kuhn, a paradigm consists of a, of a lexicon of terms, uh, concepts, uh, theories, and metaphysical assumptions. Uh, famously, Kuhn uh, drew upon uh, people like Norwood Russell Hansen and others to say that there are no neutral observations uh, within uh, a, uh, a paradigmatic burst or, or, or practice of normal science. Um, you, you are trained to think in a particular way, you're trained to see things with specific instruments in a particular way, and for various reasons your observations are theory laden. You are trained to see things uh, and to understand things in a, in a particular way, and your observations are not, uh, they're not neutral. The world in which you work frames the way in which you uh, understand nature. Second point uh, which uh, philosophers of science became particularly uh, exercised about was Kuhn's notion of incommensurability, taken up, of course, later by people like Paul Feyerabend uh, and others. What Kuhn wanted to say about the nature of uh, a paradigm was that one was to a degree enclosed within the world of a paradigm. Uh, the paradigm created values by which quality was assessed. Uh, the paradigm was the, uh, the, the, the mode by which people were trained to judge quality according to certain rules uh, and, uh, and certain standards. Um, and for that very reason, uh, when you have mature paradigms, whether they're simultaneous or uh, consecutive, uh, they are fundamentally incommensurable with each other. People who work in different paradigms are to a certain degree working in uh, different worlds. And of course you can see from that uh, quasi-relativist statement why it is that uh, when today people uh, condemn relativism within science or within the uh, study of science, Kuhn is often cited unfairly, but he's cited as the uh, grandfather or father of all kinds of uh, baleful or baneful uh, relativism. Um, one, is, one is locked inside a paradigm and uh, in, in Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions it's hard to see how uh, often it's hard to see how one gets a grip on the real world that lies outside your paradigm. Um, more interestingly I think uh, Kuhn in the postscript put forward the notion of a disciplinary matrix. Uh, the paradigm underpins the disciplinarity of a scientific community. Uh, it contains a number of elements which Kuhn uh, says together constitute a matrix. Um, for example, within any uh, paradigm there are one or more canonical texts that provide exemplars or exemplary, exemplary methods for solving uh, the puzzles that arise within the paradigm. The practical engagement with these texts, let's say in a university context when you're teaching students, is accompanied by the employment of novel and exemplary pieces of equipment along with specific and novel, sometimes, but not always, mathematical techniques. Membership of a, of a paradigmatic community is, a, is achieved by training and immersion in a tight-knit expert group within specialist institutions, uh, particularly universities, but not just universities, and it takes a number of years to learn how to be a member of the community. I mean, th that, those two aspects seems to me, seem to me to summarise the uh, most fertile parts of what Kuhn is talking about. Now I'm going to go back into the uh, 17th century. And I'm going to say there are a number of different uh, paradigmatic approaches to science. Um, we have one which is the uh, mechanical philosophy. Uh, I can see that my, um, <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint hasn't come out particularly well here. Uh, it came out well on my computer, but it's not showing well here. Don't know why. Um, here is a 1647 picture of uh, Descartes. Um, this is how he wanted to be remembered. Uh, this is a book where, at uh, the front of the book, it says Mundus est fabula. Uh, the world is, is a fable, Le Monde. Um, it's a reference to his 1632 suppressed work on the, the world. Um, Descartes became the, the paragon uh, of 
the mechanical philosophy, that is the, the attempt to explain uh, the world in terms of uh, microparticles, uh, reducing the way we understand the world in, into matter and uh, motion. Um, the mechanical philosophy is one of a number of different approaches to natural philosophy in this period. Uh, here, is, uh, some, uh, here are some pictures from his Principia Philosophiae of 1644. Uh, Descartes is a plenist. I mean, he, uh, although he's anti-Aristotelian, uh, he embraces many of the goals and structures of uh, Aristotelian philosophies. I mean, one of them is that uh, the goal of natural philosophy is to explain things uh, causally through appeal to uh, physical elements. He's a plenist. That means the world is full. Uh, there are no vacuous spaces. Uh, each sun or each star is a sun, and our own sun is a star, surrounded by uh, a vortex, a swirling vortex of uh, a fluid composed of different kinds of particles. Um, this is a, a very powerful way of uh, explaining things. Uh, it's not something that appealed to Newton um, in Newton's mature philosophy, but it did appeal to him uh, quite early on. Another um, very powerful uh, approach to natural philosophy was uh, developed by Galileo, of course. Um, Galileo uh, did a number of things in natural philosophy. I think one of the, uh, you know, to summarize it in a, in a minute is, is slightly absurd, but uh, Galileo uh, promoted the use of instruments in natural philosophy, uh, the use of the telescope, which you see in uh, the starry message or messenger of uh, early 1610. Uh, more famously and perhaps more uh, influentially, Galileo uh, mathematized uh, the free fall of objects close to the Earth's surface. That is the, the, the sum total of the distance fallen is proportional to the square of the time taken. Uh, th that is something that uh, very few people, a bit like Newton uh, almost a century later, that the, the ability to do that, or the idea that uh, one could uh, mathematize or quantify something that was uh, thought to be essentially qualitative, uh, was a, an extraordinary um, triumph. Uh, of Galileo's approach to natural philosophy. This is the approach that Newton uh, will uh, build on. It, it is Galileo that Newton sees himself uh, as, as following, I think. If he's standing on anyone's shoulders, it is uh, Galileo and not Robert Hooke. Another way of approaching natural philosophy is the uh, English Baconian uh, approach, which is very, very different. What I want to say is that th these are uh, extraordinarily different approaches to understanding the natural world. The, the, these people are uh, deeply opposed to each other. Um, they have little in common with each other, I think, although we uh, superficially think uh, that they are all uh, inheritors of and practitioners of the scientific method. The people I'm looking at are all engaged in very, very different kinds of paradigmatic projects with their own uh, instruments uh, and with their own uh, canonical texts. The Baconian experimental philosophy uh, is, as Francis Bacon says, part of natural history, um, surprisingly enough. It, it is not predominantly concerned with mathematics. It's, about, it's concerned with the collection and the collation of facts. Of course, the term fact etymologically revealing that it is something that is made. Um, but it, they, they can be found. Uh, but Bacon is also interested in uh, the experimental production of facts, but it is part of natural history. Um, it's very, very different from the mechanical philosophy. Uh, it's very, very different from the kind of project that Galileo was involved in. Um, a follower of Bacon, of course, is uh, Robert Boyle. If we jump forward into the, uh, in, into the restoration of England in 1660, uh, then we find uh, Robert Boyle's um, new experiments, physico-mechanical, of 1660, becoming for a while the uh, canonical text for practicing natural philosophy or experimental philosophy in England and to a lesser extent uh, in Europe. Uh, and on the right hand side we have the air pump, again uh, devised by Ralph Greatrex and Robert Hooke in 1659 and used by Robert Boyle. Uh, there's a glass receiver at the top, 
and the, there are various uh, experiments, uh, combustion, compression, uh, evacuation, of course, that you can do with uh, the air pump. And we can see, if you like, the Baconian program um, reaching some degree of fulfillment in late 17th century England around a series of texts uh, in Boyle's books, uh, also in the Philosophical Transactions and the uh, Journal des Savants. Um, but these are descriptions of, uh, of experiments using very specific instruments that are only available to a very limited number of people. Um, th these are uh, what, uh, in the 1950s, were, were called the, the, the cyclotrons of their age. Um, th these are pieces of equipment that uh, only very few people can have access to, because um, you, you have to employ a glass blower almost full time to blow and repair the receiver on the top. Um, finally, the magnetic philosophy. And here we have, uh, I think, a, a largely English tradition, uh, starting with um, the, the Colchester physician, physician to Elizabeth, uh, William Gilbert's De Magnete on the Lodestone of 1600. Uh, this is a 1628 uh, edition I have on the uh, right-hand side. But this is uh, profoundly influential, if you want to use the term influential, on English natural philosophy in the uh, 17th century. Um, it's something that Newton responds to uh, very badly. Uh, he doesn't like um, aspects of the Baconian philosophy. Uh, he's deep, Newton is deeply opposed to the Baconian philosophy in many ways. He's deeply opposed to the magnetical philosophy. Uh, he's deeply opposed, like very deeply opposed to the Cartesian philosophy as well. So we, we see um, heterogeneity in uh, Newton's, uh, rather in, in natural philosophy in 17th century England. Is the, are these separate paradigms or are they in what Kuhn calls a pre-paradigmatic uh, state? I think they're paradigms uh, because they conform to some of Kuhn's rules for something being a paradigm. They coexist and to some extent what we see um, towards the end of the 17th century and the early 18th century is a consolidation of these approaches to natural philosophy into something like the Newtonian philosophy. But I want to say towards the end uh, that uh, at the very moment when all these things crystallize and coalesce, there are brand new disciplines and new paradigms that come into being. That's a picture of Newton from his time as an MP, his first time as an MP uh, in the summer of 1689, uh, when he's a supporter of the, the Williamite Glorious Revolution. Um, he, he was effectively a politician by now. This is two years after the Principia was published. So it's, it's an extraordinary turn of events. Um, I think he thought his creative powers had gone. Uh, he was in his, um, well, he was, uh, what, um, in his late 40s. Um, he wanted to turn his attention to things he really cared about, like politics and running the Royal Mint, um, which he did. If we go back to, 19, to 1672, we, we can see the first articulation of the, the Newtonian philosophy. Uh, the paper on the the famous paper on the heterogeneity of white light of February 1672. Um, the repercussions of this paper um, gave rise to Newton thinking through uh, methodological and disciplinary claims about his own practice. He said, he told a number of people, the heterogeneity of white light was an indubitable theory established by the crucial experiment. It was not a mere hypothesis. I mean, Newton's anti-hypotheticalism is the most extreme of anybody in his lifetime. Newton defined a ray of light phenomenally. Again, this is almost unique in this period. That is to say, um, he defined a ray of light without reference to its physical structure. A ray of light was not uh, a particle or a wave, but it was its uh, degree of refraction. It was its index of refraction, or as he put it, is its degree of refrangibility. That's essentially what a ray of light was. Um, hypotheses and merely theoretical statements about the internal physical structure of bodies caused disputes and were not allowed in publicly stated natural philosophy, according to Newton. You were not allowed to uh, write down or claim as true 
uh, statements uh, about things that were not um, evidentially corroborated. Only, mathematical cert only mathematically certain statements uh, were suitable for scientific progress. We go forward, uh, as many of you know, 1675, 76, uh, Newton gets upset by being criticised. Uh, he never liked being criticised for anything. Uh, he took away his scientific ball and went uh, private and studied alchemy and theology. Uh, but for every so often, um, uh, a bit like Al Pacino in Godfather 3, he's pulled back out of his room in Trinity College. Uh, that isn't in Godfather 3. But anyway, in, in 16... 80, there is the, the brightest comet that human beings have seen for the last few uh, millennia appearing at the end of 6080. This is the view from Frankfurt. It's scary. It's frightening. It, it's, a, it's a harbinger of very bad things. Um, but of course, natural philosophers want to bring comets within natural philosophy. They want to make it part of a science. That is to say, how can we understand scientifically uh, what comets are? And there's wide discussion about this extraordinary comet that appeared in uh, November, late November 1680, and then disappeared in mid-December, and it reappeared in January, or rather a second comet reappeared in January 1681. And the question for uh, astronomers and philosophers is, are these two comets the same comet? And if not, uh, what kind of things are they? Um, in England, people like Robert Hooke, uh, Christopher Wren, uh, John Flamsteed and others discussed the path of the comet and also the nature of the comet. Uh, Hooke and Flamsteed are committed magnetic philosophers, so they think it's one comet that has gone to, towards the sun and been, as a magnet, it's suddenly switched uh, its polarity and then been pushed away by the sun. Um, that makes sense. Uh, at one level, it, it's, a, it's a comprehensible physical explanation. And Flamsteed approached the Lucasian professor of mathematics uh, to see what he thought about that. And it, it, it's, a, it's an extraordinary period in uh, Newton's uh, intellectual development, I think, the, these letters with Flamsteed. Newton is always, it seems to me, provoked by other people to think very, very quickly and brilliantly about things he hadn't previously considered but later he would pretend that he had thought about them all along. I think, the, I think this is one uh, particular issue that's, that's crucially significant for Newton in developing his theory in the Principia. The comet of, 16, uh, of late 1680 comes from the bottom right. It gets to B, and then it gets to K, and that's the last time uh, astronomers uh, saw it until it reappeared round about D uh, in January 1681. What Newton wants to know is, is it possible that a magnet um, caused uh, the orbit or, or caused the comet to turn in front of the sun? And for various reasons, he says, no, it, it's not. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, 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 the time between uh, B and uh, or K and D uh, was simply um, uh, too long for the comet to have turned in front of the sun. Remember, the sun is S there. So Newton says, uh, if you take the observation seriously, it must have gone round the back of the sun. But then if it did, there is no mechanism for it coming back round again. If it was a magnet and it changed its polarity, when it got to sea, it would have gone off, uh, off to the top of the screen as you see it. Um, but if it's two comets, then it didn't. The other thing Newton knows from experiments done uh, as a young man is that uh, hot lodestones do not work. That's an old, uh, that, that's something that astronomers, uh, sorry, that, that people have known uh, from, uh, for many centuries. And Newton did a number of experiments to prove that was true. Hot magnets or lodestones don't work. So if the sun is uh, hot, um, it can't be a magnet. And he does go into um, some discussion about whether the sun is hot or not. And he concludes the sun is hot. Therefore, it's not a magnet. After this, and after some discussion with Edmund Halley in 1684, Newton writes, uh, over a period of two years, the uh, greatest work, or one of the two or three greatest works in the history of science, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. The first two books are largely mathematical, 
the, the second book deals with uh, motions in resisting media. Uh, the third book, uh, On the System of the World, concerns this physical world, the world we live in. I mean, Newton is uh, deeply opposed to all systems except his own, because he thinks it's true. Um, Newton showed that this uh, e extraordinary equation, uh, universal gravitation, uh, which combines, uh, you know, it's, it's a gravitational constant multiplied by the product of the masses, divided by the square of the distance between them. Uh, it can account for uh, all phenomena within reason, uh, but including tides, which no one had explained properly, cometary motion, which no one had explained properly. He now agreed with Flamsteed that the comets of 1680 and 1681 were, were, were one comet, and that um, b became the source of the great friction that existed between Flamsteed and Newton. And of course, the oblate spheroidal shape of the Earth, which to, to, to commit oneself to which is uh, an implicit criticism of the entire French Cartesian program and indeed the entire car uh, French cartographic program. As George Smith has, has shown, uh, what, one of the implications of Newton's theory is, I, I think, largely that it's unfalsifiable um, as far as Newton sees it. He sees it as very unlikely that his theory is unfalsifiable. It seems to be true for all the observed universe. Uh, by inference, we can assume that it's true uh, for those parts of the universe uh, that we can't see. If one comes up with candidate anomalous events within the Newtonian system, uh, Newton and his followers became confident that if the event appeared to be anomalous, it was due to uh, some problem with the, uh, the observer or with the person who claimed it was an anomalous. In time, one would find that these uh, apparent anomalies confirm the incredible precision, uh, the incredible depth to which Newton's theory uh, ran. It had to be true. Um, the Principia created a new paradigm in physics by introducing, and I think in, in a number of different ways, and introduced new physical entities such as attractive forces whose effects could be seen. It argued that a physical explanation did not initially require appeal to standard physical entities. So this goes against what almost everybody in natural philosophy believed. Um, to explain something, all you need to do is, is posit a, a general law, which is mathematical, that explains every phenomena that you can find. You don't need to appeal to waves or particles. In fact, according to Newton, you shouldn't, because they're likely to be fantasies. They're likely to be... Uh, figments of your imagination. He showed that key parts of the world could be mathematized. So the world is mathematical. Not every part of the world, the life sciences, maybe the earth sciences, what's covered by those, perhaps chemistry, parts of chemistry, they're not mathematizable, according to Newton. But um, what Newton's uh, universal gravitation uh, principle covers, it covers and it explains. And I think very importantly, in disciplinary terms, it changed the relations between mathematics and physics. As uh, Lieber was pointing out to some extent earlier on, uh, mathematical physics and physics are, are separate categories, what, even as late as the late 16th century. The, the title of Newton's book, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, uh, shows that Newton doesn't agree with that. Right at the heart of natural philosophy is Mathematics, And I think also um, what that does is give authority to natural philosophers to identify parts of the Bible that refer to uh, the natural world, so geocentric passages. It licenses natural philosophers to identify those passages, and it licenses natural philosophers to tell theologians how it is they should interpret those passages. So... The Principia is, is intrinsically or implicitly something that intervenes in the relationship not just between mathematics and physics, but between natural philosophy and theology. I'll jump through the problems with attraction. Lots of people, uh, including this man, uh, the, 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 the greatest intellect with the exception of Newton of the time, they don't like the notion of uh, attraction because it is a return to a kind of voodoo uh, idea of occult qualities, according to uh, Leibniz. Uh, 
Um, it doesn't make sense within traditional natural philosophy. However, um, Newton bequeathed two different uh, notions to uh, the 18th century. Uh, just very briefly, again, um, Newton did not just produce the Principia Mathematica, uh, which relies on an attack on uh, vortices, it relies on uh, an attack on ethers, uh, unseen things that cause objects to fall. Um, he didn't just produce this book, he produced another book, which was the canonical statement of his optics. And in this book, um, as time went on over the three editions, he added more and more queries, so questions, uh, where he revealed what he really thought about things like ethers. And in this book, he is committed to an ether, or he's committed to two ethers. And there's this l dual legacy throughout the 18th century. Uh, there is the Newton who is uh, anti-ethereal, the Newton of the Principia, and the Newton of optics. Throughout the 18th century, uh, self-confessed Newtonians uh, worked hard to ignore, uh, evade, or efface these, uh, these tensions, we might call them, or perhaps um, contradictions within uh, the Newtonian uh, legacy. So the last few slides. This is where we go back to Kuhn. How did Newton's work produce communities of practitioners? We, we've dealt with the kind of uh, conceptual parts of Newton's work. Very briefly, perhaps the most important parts of it is how does it get promulgated uh, in, um, amongst experts? How does Newton's work produce communities of practitioners so as to constitute a discipline or a disciplinary matrix? It happens in universities through the teaching of disciples, people who have proximity to Newton himself, people who purport to know the mind of the godlike genius. Uh, people like Roger Coates uh, in Cambridge, or here, uh, David Gregory, the, um, the Episcopalian uh, exiles from Scotland, uh, David Gregory and John Kyle, who are the, the, the great Newtonians of early 18th century um, Oxford. Through the core reproduction of experiments, by, like those performed by uh, Jean Théophile uh, Desagulier, Newton's greatest experimenter, uh, the person who uh, produced, uh, after the Peace Treaty of Utrecht of 1713-14, um, Desagulier reproduced Newton's crucial experiments for the French and the Dutch when they couldn't do it themselves because they didn't have the right prisms or they didn't follow the right protocols. Desagulier showed them that Newton's theory was correct. Through the production of new canonical textbooks, but especially through the production of new editions of the Principia in 1713-14, and 1726. More indirectly, Newtonianism was created uh, by inspiring people through a series of lectures that took place and demonstrations that took place to the general public, starting with a series of lectures in 1698. And we see many of Newton's followers, uh, William Whiston, uh, Francis Hawkesby Senior, uh, and a whole series of others, they, they make their name and they make their living uh, through giving uh, lectures. John Kyle is another one of them. They, they give public lectures to people uh, and they flog instruments to go along with it because uh, instruments go hand in hand with the Newtonian philosophy as Kuhn pointed out. Newtonianism consists in a particular set of dispositions and languages, um, a sneer at foreigners perhaps, intoned by the faithful, hypotheses non fingo. I do not feign hypotheses, Newton says, in the general scolium to the 1713 second edition of the Principia. And of course, if you wanted to be seen as truly and properly scientific, then of course you had to rid your own work uh, of hypotheses uh, and make sure it's not a system unless it's true, <laughs> in which case you can have a system. Um, but also to sneer at other people for having um, unwarranted claims in their own work. Here is um, a Francis Hawkesby electrostatic machine, um, which produces um, neon lights when, on the left-hand side when you turn it round fast and it's full of mercury. And on the right-hand side is uh, Desagulier in his um, uh, Freemason garb, and that picture is from the Freemasons. Um, so the final slide. Um, 
the Newtonian paradigm was constituted by groups of practitioners, uh, including France after 1740, 1737, if you want to be uh, accurate, exactly 40 years after the Principia. Um, learning how to be Newtonians, learning how to uh, be part of this community by solving problems within a Principia framework. Um, but it's important to note, as historians have done for a long time, that to some extent the Newtonian tradition was saved or made by only by importing brand new techniques from Newton's enemy Leibniz and his followers, uh, the Bernoullis, uh, Euler, and then Lagrange. Um, the Newtonian system was saved by being uh, infiltrated with uh, continental rational mechanics. Uh, continental astronomers, uh, particularly Laplace, uh, worked hard to remove anomalies within astronomy. Uh, they refined definitions. The great uh, uh, mathematician uh, Alexis Claude Clairaut worked really hard to refine Newton's definitions, the definition of mass, the definition of force in uh, the Principia, by making new predictions, like the return of Halley's Comet in, in Christmas Day 1758. Halley's Comet is saved as a periodic comet because a German astronomer sees it for the first time. Halley is saved, but so is Newton. The, universal, the, the inverse square law is saved. And by taking more and more precise measurements, which all corroborate Newton's theory. But by the end of the 18th century, I think the, the limits of Newtonianism were clear. People had tried to Newtonianize medicine, but these efforts were rather pathetic. They tried to Newtonianize the life sciences, the social sciences. Uh, people like uh, David Hume had uh, wonderfully tried to Newtonize, uh, Newtonize philosophy, and they'd all failed. Newtonianism worked within its own narrow domain and, uh, and nowhere else. Before science was split into many disciplines at the end of the 18th century, uh, Newtonianism was uh, briefly one paradigm, but in a form uh, infected by, uh, infected, I mean, informed by uh, continental analytic mechanics that Newton could never have imagined. Thank you. Any hands? Yes. I wonder if we could take um, take you back a bit to what Kuhn has said uh, about Newton, about paradigms, and about the 17th century. Um, Kuhn comments somewhere. I forget whether it's in structure or elsewhere. Uh, that the paradigmatic revolutions which characterize the 17th century are in fact in three areas which are mathematical, physical from classical times. Um, that is mechanics, optics, and astronomy. Um, and that does not necessarily constitute what we call the scientific revolution from Copernicus to Newton. Uh, Kuhn, in fact, separates them. Um, uh, these were the classical paradigms, and these were how they changed in the 17th century. Um, so once again, I think we're in a state of moving between traditions and paradigms as we talk both uh, about Newtonian traditions uh, uh, and conceive of them as also, in certain senses, paradigmatic. But I just wonder about your thoughts about Kuhn's reference to the 17th century and these classically established mathematical, physical uh, practices. Um. I think if, I, I don't know whether people, uh, people who, who know the structure reason well agree, but the uh, Kuhn is very weak, I think, on the set in the structure. He's very weak on um, the 17th century. I mean, he's more interested in Copernicus because he'd written a book on Copernicus. That's what he knew. Uh, he knows uh, a hell of a lot about black body theory and the constant does discontinuity uh, because he's uh, interviewed some of the people who, who worked on that. Um, he knows a lot about Maxwell. 
And of course he knows a lot about Aristotle, uh, because it was reading Aristotle that gave him a conversion experience. Uh, in the structure, he doesn't say very much uh, about, um, so I'm, I'm not evading your question, I'm just saying in the structure itself, he it doesn't say very much uh, about these, uh, these, these events. Um, I think the, there is a tension between uh, King talking about uh, a discipline that requires, that is recondite and requires technical expertise. So he talks about it, you know, he talks about schools and, uh, and something that's like the Cop Copernican uh, astronomical system. But I think he really, well, I, I think he, he wants to get going on looking at, at how these things were taught, um, how information uh, moved out of textbooks and went into universities, into schools. Um, and I think that the limits of the book uh, restrict him from, from doing that. So I think he, he doesn't have much to say in the structure on those three um, aspects that you, that you talk about. Uh, I, I don't have anything more to, to add to that. I mean, you, you, I'd be interested to know what you have to say. Um, I think it uh, uh, comes when he, he states the considerations, the kind of transformations you get of uh, uh, sections of physics in the early 19th century. Um, but uh, I, I just always am struck by uh, his sense that uh, uh, you get practices which are combinations of maths and physics from classical times. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's what he picks out uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the 17th century through the term paradigm. Yep. What paradigms change then? And it is those paradigms of the classically established mathematical physical uh, practices. Yeah, and of course, he, his, his other example, I can't remember if I said it, but, but it is chemistry, isn't it? I mean, he spends a long time talking about the, um, the, the, the chemical revolution responding to, to Butterfield, who he called it a delayed scientific revolution, as you know. Newton is is uh, is not uh, is not constrained, um, as as many people in the audience know. I mean, he is a he was a heretic, uh, and he was a heretic by the time he wrote the Principia Mathematica. But he kept it quiet, um, so that it, it required. You know, it, it's not it's it's obviously not the case that, um, and you didn't say that, but it's not the case that Britain is a is a sort of sea of, of modern toleration and uh, uh, continental Roman Catholic Europe is not. Um, and conversely, I think uh, Galileo, uh, although he's under house arrest in 1633, uh, is able to transmit his information to uh, Mersenne. So his work is published in 1636, uh, before it's published in the, the canonical uh, demonstrations and discourses and demonstrations of 1638. So Galileo is not prevented, I think, from having his work seep out through disciples like uh, Torricelli and Viviani. Um, I, you, you know, and, and from the point of view of uh, looking at uh, some of the, the, the people who might be considered to have been constrained, uh, I don't think Descartes really constrained. Um, after, after Le Monde, I mean, Le Monde is broken up into the four works of 1637, really, which deal with optics, uh, meteorology, uh, geometry, and so on. But the, 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 the full Cartesian philosophy is, is published in the Principia Philosophiae of 1644. 
So I don't, I don't think that, uh, that constraints that are political and religious have that much of an effect, to be honest. There's always a way for these things to get out. Um, it, you know, this isn't a, a, a grandiose statement that you can't stop ideas coming out. Well, having said that, it does look like something like that. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, ideas can be blocked for a few years, maybe. Um, but, you know, you, all you have to do is to talk to somebody, um, smuggle out something, have it published in Amsterdam. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way to do it. Okay, that's one question here. The moment for my question after the intervention has passed, I just wanted to say something in connection with paper mentioned earlier, it was called Two Traditions, I believe, <clears throat> and its purpose was exactly that which you said, in order to save the uh, scientific revolution, uh, to make it that part of, apply to that part of science, which had been highly developed and mathematized to some extent in antiquity, and to do that, he had to divide optics into two sections, one which advanced that is to say, which had its origins in antiquity, and one which didn't, sort of physical optics, uh, which uh, uh, would have a later development, uh, and other matters that were developed during the 17th century or first discussed, like electricity, they too, in the 18th century and 19th century, uh, submitted to their revolution, becoming mathematized. He was very pleased with himself for having divided optics into two parts in order to save the uh, scientific revolution. Yeah, no thanks. I was deliberately evading John's question by talking about the structure. No, not, not the essential tension. Okay, I think this will have to be the last question, if that's okay. It's a quick one. You mentioned that Newton was opposed to the magnetic philosophy. Yeah. Was that just his beef with Flamsteed about the comet? Because I would have thought with Gilbert's De Magneto, that would have been a, that's very much in the Newtonian tradition of doing experiments, going against the, uh, the prevailing thinking. Um, uh, yes, but I, mean, I think if you, if you read De Magneto, I know John knows more about this than I do, but they're, they're, they're completely rudimentary kinds of experiments compared to what, what Newton's doing. I mean, Newton's experiments that he did in early, the early 1670s are much more, in fact, they're very, they look very Faraday, actually. I mean, he, he, he's looking at what were really lines of force, uh, of fields around with magnetic filings, uh, because he's been spurred into doing that by Robert Hooke. But they're very, very different. They're much more uh, nuanced and sophisticated than anything you find in uh, William Gilbert. Having said that, you know, William Gilbert uh, was a major inspiration for Galileo. Okay, thanks very much again.